Poems to a Listener, Readings and Conversation with Contemporary Poets. Three dollars cash for a pair of catalog shoes was what the midwife charged my mama for bringing me. We wasn't so country then, says mom, you being the last one. And we couldn't, like we done when she brought your brother, send her out to the pen and let her pick out a pig. Welcome to Poems to a Listener. I'm Henry Lyman, and in this half-hour program, we'll be visiting with poet and novelist Alice Walker and listening to poems about her childhood, her student years at Spelman College, her travels in African countries, and her experience of the civil rights movement. Alice Walker's mother and father were sharecroppers, and the place where she was born and where the midwife delivered her was about 20 miles out of Eatonton, Georgia. It was in the curve in a road, in a dirt road. The house was set back some distance from the road and there was a well. There was a, a pond and my father used to go there and catch frogs. Well, your mother says we weren't so country then. We wasn't so country then. How does she mean that? She meant that they were no longer into bartering for years, they bartered for everything, so that if she gave birth and the midwife helped, she gave a pig or um, peanuts or corn or whatever. But by the time I arrived, they were using money. Baptism. They dunked me in the creek, a tiny brooklet, muddy, gooey with rotting leaves, a greenish mold floating, definable. For love it was, for love of God at seven, all in white, with God's mud ruining my snowy socks and his bullfrog spores gluing up my face. Where was the creek? Near the church. It was really a dirty creek you know, but it was where people baptized folk, and it was um, a very moving day. I mean, it was just such an interesting thing to go down to the creek, beautifully dressed in white, with all of these other people dressed in white, and to be held, you know, by the people of the community, literally in the arms of the people of the community, and to be baptized by them, and to feel very much in community with them. In the poem, you say, uh, God's mud. Oh, well, you know, the mud is God. God was in the mud. And also in me. And in everyone. Oh, yes. Sunday School, circa 1950. Who made you was always the question. The answer was always God. Well, there we stood, three feet high, heads bowed, leaning into bosoms. Now I no longer recall the catechism or brood on the genesis of life. No, I ponder the exchange itself and salvage mostly the leaning. You ponder the exchange. Yes. And the leaning? And the leaning, yes. Well, I forgot all of the things that we were discussing, but what I will always remember is the closeness that I felt to the people who were engaging me with these questions and fairly large women holding us, you know, and... Um, hugging you. Hugging, yes. A lot of hugging, a lot of hugging. And you didn't learn anything hardly unless someone was hugging you or, or touching you in some way, you know. In these dissenting times, in these dissenting times I shall write of the old men I knew and the young men I loved and of the gold-toothed women, mighty of arm, 
who dragged us all to church. I can see them so clearly. Mm -hmm. That was the center, really, of the community then, the church. Then. Oh, yes. And the women were the center of the church. It was the women who did all the work that kept it going. You know, they were formidable women. They were physically big and very generous, very kind-hearted, strong. You had to go to funerals, even if you didn't know the people. Your mama always did, usually your pa. In new patent leather shoes, it wasn't so bad. And if it rained, the graves dropped open. And if the sun was shining, you could take some of the flowers home in your pocketbook. At six and seven, the face in the gray box is always your daddy's old schoolmate mowed down before his time. You don't even ask after a while what makes them lie so awfully straight and still. If there is a picture of Jesus underneath the coffin lid, you might, during a boring sermon, without shouting or anything, wonder who painted it and how he would like all eternity to stare it down. You've never seen this kind of casket? No, I never have. Oh, um, you should go and see them. There, there are some very interesting coffins and caskets made. Um, but when I was a little girl, I was amazed at the way coffins were decorated and how ironic it was that they often had these paintings underneath the coffin lid. Who does the he refer to? The person who designed the coffin. So I was just thinking about such a person, a, a painter, who painted coffin lids and how he would like to look at his own painting forever. But of course now I understand that coffins are designed for the living, not for the dead. The dead person could care less. The old men used to sing and lifted a brother carefully out the door. I used to think they were born knowing how to gently swing a casket. They shuffled softly, eyes dry, more awkward with the flowers than with the widow. After they'd put the body in, and stood around waiting in their brown suits. They're waiting. Their turn is coming up, and they are very well aware of that. I just felt so much for those old men. They wear these suits of improbable colors, snuff brown and kelly green and a kind of russet and they didn't fit that well. But even so, they had such grace, you know. I mean, they, they weren't that used to handling flowers, but um, they handled the flowers and the widow and the children very well. They seem born knowing how to move a casket, born knowing these mm -hmm. actions. And they would have been even more graceful putting a casket or a coffin on a wagon than they were trying to fit it into a Cadillac hearse. Winking at a funeral. Those were the days of winking at a funeral. Romance blossomed in the pews. Love signaled through the hymns. What did we know? Who smelled the flowers slowly fading? Knew the arsonist of the church? Who knew the arsonist of the church? Our church was burned three times. Um, when your children in church, you know, you sort of wink at each other and you have 
childish concerns, but in fact, the church, which was the sacred uh, meeting place for the community, was always under attack. The clan or whoever gathered to burn the church, and we were oblivious to this. So did you yourself experience the clan at... Uh or anything like that as a child? Not in this community. I did later when I was, you know, in Mississippi and in the movement in Georgia when, as an adult. Uncles. They had broken teeth and billy club scars, but we didn't notice or mind. They were uncles. It was their job to come home every summer from the north and tell my father he wasn't no man, and make my mother cry and long for Denver, Jersey City, Philadelphia. They were uncles. Who noticed how much they drank and acted womanish with their do-rags? We were nieces, and they were almost always good for a nickel and sometimes a dime. It was almost as if it was their job then to come down and... These uh, uncles and cousins and aunts came home and they always had very large, shiny cars and they had very gaudy, uh, flimsy clothing, but we liked it because we didn't see gaudiness and flimsiness and we thought it was terrific. The do-rags. The do-rags, yeah. But there is a special beauty, I think, about people like my parents who were never seduced away from the South and who always felt that they didn't have much, but what they had, they freely shared. Um, they chose community over, in a way, adventure. And um, they were, were happy to stay there and raise their children. Women. They were women then, my mama's generation, husky of voice, stout of step, with fists as well as hands. How they battered down doors and ironed starched white shirts. How they led armies, head ragged generals, across mined fields booby-trapped kitchens to discover books, desks, a place for us. How they knew what we must know without knowing a page of it themselves. Your mother was one of those. Yeah, which I think is just the most extraordinary thing to essentially spend your whole life trying to prepare someone for something that you don't have yourself. Um, so she just said, well, my, ch my children are going to be educated irregardless. I mean, they can turn out well, they can turn out bad, they can love me, they can hate me, but they're going to get an education. So, yeah, she had hands and she had fists, and she used both. Compulsory Chapel. A quiet afternoon, the speaker dull, the New Testament washed out. Through the window, a lonely blue jay makes noisy song. The speaker crashes on through his speech. All eyes are upon him. Over his left ear, the thick hair is beginning to slip. I would not mind if I were a sinner. But as it is, let me assure you, I sleep alone. Where was that? Compulsory chapel. Spellman. You went to Africa after college. Yes. You kept then a book of poems, a journal of poems. Uh, well, I didn't mean to, but it seemed very natural while I was in, especially in Kenya. I spent a lot of time alone, and I wrote. I wrote. It was company. 
It was a way to deal with all the things happening to me. And it was a way to keep... I don't really like taking photographs, you know. It would never really occur to me to take a photograph. That's why, to me, the poems that are like haiku are really photographs, but written. A book of poems, Mount Kenya's Bluish Peaks, Wangari, my new name. Under the moon, luminous huts, brown breasts stuck out to taunt the sullen wind. A young man puts a question in his language. I invariably end up Married. So you're always being asked to wed? Oh, I was always being asked to wed. And I was always being very obliging and saying, oh, of course, because I didn't understand the language. And, of course, I always knew that at the decisive moment I could say no. <laughs> you know. <laughs> a small boat, a placid lake, Suddenly, at one's hand, two ears, hippopotamus. Floating shakily down the Nile on my rented raft, I try to be a native queen, a prudent giraffe on the bank, turns up his nose. You were, nevertheless, from another country. I liked people a lot. I liked the people I lived with, you know. Everyone treated me so beautifully. As one of the family. Oh, yes. But, but as one of the family that, you know, was from somewhere else. Very American. I want to eat the native food, but a whole goat? You are a Negro, yes, but that is a kind of food, isn't it? The white man used to eat you? Well, well, <laughs> yes, well, um, there's a lot implied in that. Oh, well. <laughs> truly, I, I'm aware of every bit of it. And of course, there was a kind of consumption going on. Oh well, I mean, yeah. economic consumption. Economic of the consumption. People. Oh, surely, yes. Uh, sharecroppers are certainly eaten up. Unusual things amuse us. A little African girl sees my white friend and runs. She thinks he wants her for his dinner. This is sort of a play, of course, on the feeling that, you know, long ago that missionaries went to Africa and were promptly put into pots and cooked and eaten by the Africans. Right, it's a complete reverse. And it was so incredible to realize that many of the children of Africa have that same feeling about white people. The American from Minnesota speaks hobbitly of revolution. Men of the Mau Mau smile, their fists holding bits of Kenya earth. Hobbitly. 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 Of revolution. <laughs> oh, yes. But the men of the Mau Mau know what it really is. Oh, yes. <laughs> Without having to use the word. Oh, yep. A proper English meal near the mountains. More tea, please. Down the street, a man walks quite completely nude. How did you become involved in the civil rights movement? What... Uh... What happened? How did it begin for you? I was just so uh, moved by the faces of black people as they confronted 
the racists, you know, I was really ready to join all these shining people, college kids who um, were in the movement and who, you know, really were trying to infuse all of America with the real conscience and with the real sense of what they used to call the beloved community. And I guess I connected with this because I had been brought up in a loving community, you know, a beloved community in which people bartered and supported each other and, you know, took care of burials and took care of widows. And so I knew what they what they meant. They didn't seem crazy to me as they seemed to many people, you know. I mean, oh, you're crazy. You can't change white people. But I said, oh, no. You know, once they see that there's something else to be, there's another way, they will, of course, change. Some did. Some didn't. <laughs> It is true, I've always loved the daring ones, like the black young man who tried to crash all barriers at once, wanted to swim at a white beach in Alabama, nude. Look at that nigger with those white folks my dark, arrogant friend turns calmly, curiously, helpfully. Where? he asks. It was the fifth arrest in as many days. How glad I am that I can look surprised still. Peter always thought the only way to enlighten southern towns was to introduce himself to the county sheriff first thing. Another thing Peter wanted was to be cremated. But we couldn't find him when he needed it. But he was just a yid, 17. Does this refer to an actual event? To an actual person, a young white boy from Brooklyn or somewhere who uh, had very backward notions about how to operate in the South. And he never understood the anti-Semitism, for instance, of the South. He didn't understand the anti-Semitism of the North. In other words, he came south to work with black people, and yet he felt that he had to have permission from the white sheriff or the white people in power. Which, that really uh, is naive. Yes, it was very naive. It was very dangerous because they, of course, hated him. I never liked white folks, really. It happened quite suddenly one day. A pair of amber eyes, I think he had. Look, honey, said the blonde, amply boobed babe in the green G-string. I like you, sure, I ain't prejudiced. But the Lord didn't give me legs like these because he wanted to see them dangling from a poplar but they are so much prettier than mine. Would you really mind, he asked, wanting her to dance. Then there was the picture of the bleak-eyed little black girl waving the American flag, holding it gingerly with the very tips of her fingers. It's almost as if she's afraid to touch it, or that it's out of reach. She's letting it go. She's letting it go. Mm hmm. Yep. Because it's out of reach anyway? Well, because it's insufficient, you know, for her needs. You just can see on her face that the flag 
has no no real relevance to to her life because of what is done to her in the name of the flag. The democratic order, such things in twenty years I understood. My father, back blistered, beat me because I could not stop crying. He'd had enough fuss, he said, for one damn voting day. What happened to him? What was the... Well, my father was the first uh, black man to vote in our town. It took an extraordinary amount of courage. White people gathered and, you know, called names and made threats and... Why is he beating you here? Because of the stress that he was under. He was very tense. He was very uptight. And he was very mean to everybody at home. Um, and the back blister description is symbolic. I mean, I always felt that he had been beaten. The poem is, is sort of my, to celebrate my understanding of his anger and how it had turned against us. Medicine. Grandma sleeps with my sick grandpa so she can get him during the night medicine to stop the pain. In the morning, clumsily, I wake them. Her eyes look at me from underneath his withered arm. The medicine is all in her long, unbraided hair. She must have been really special. Well, I, I thought so, but I'm not sure he always did. He was a pretty tough cookie. Oh, toughy, toughy. But in any case, um, after a while, I think, in a, you know, if you live with somebody for 40 years um, and they become ill, you tend to them, you know. If you, you, there must be a way that nature keeps you sort of um, connected to people, even if they've mistreated you. Something that maybe isn't love, but is a kind of forgiveness and a kind of um, understanding. Looking down into my father's dead face for the last time. My mother said, without tears, without smiles, without regrets, but with civility. Good night, Willie Lee. I'll see you in the morning. And it was then I knew that the healing of all our wounds is forgiveness that permits a promise of our return at the end. We've been visiting with poet and novelist Alice Walker and listening to poems from Once, Revolutionary Petunias, and Good Night Willie Lee, all published by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for joining us. Poems to a Listener was produced by WFCR, Amherst, Massachusetts, with technical assistance by Sheldon Katzman. Financial assistance was provided by the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Massachusetts Foundation for Humanities and Public Policy.